This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that fascinating session. I hope that this session will be equally interesting. Um, we've heard um, really a lot of issues that have been raised so far, and all of them touching on the on the title of this session. My name is Jonathan Venny. I work for the Overseas Development Institute. Previously, I worked for Christian Aid for six and a half years. Part of that was in um, Colombia. Um, before that, I also did work on uh, land rights, indigenous peoples' rights in, in the Philippines. I think Andy Whitman was here. I worked with him many years ago. And uh, in Peru, with the Oxfam Mining Ombudswoman, and I think there's an ex-Mining Ombudswoman here as well, so a really fascinating um, and important role. And what I learned in, in, in my work on these issues is that the story is so similar all over the world especially when it comes to multinational companies providing, it's not just indigenous groups of course um, affected, certainly in Colombia there are indigenous groups, um, Afro-Colombian groups and also campesino groups, peasants, just basically everyone who, who does not quite fit into the model of development that is being um, suggested and sometimes forced on people. I'm not going to talk for very long, what I'd like to do is introduce the speakers um, I'm going to ask your patience in this session. We have two Spanish speakers, and they don't speak English. So they're going to have their um, sessions, uh, their, their, their talks translated. I think, you know, you're going to speak for, you, in, in terms of, you know, they'll say a sentence and then it will be translated. That, is, that requires patience from the audience, which I, I do ask for. They'll speak for 10 minutes each, which will be, in effect, 20 minutes. Uh, and also we have Christine. Uh, who will, does speak English, um, so that's going to be uh, easier, easier for a lot of you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask um, Padre Ubi to speak first. Um, when I arrived in Colombia, one of the first things I wanted to do was to link the human rights situation with the multinationals and the business situation, and actually the person they asked me to get in touch with was Jorge Molano, who is here now as one of the leading human rights defenders in Colombia and also has for a long time made these links between uh, the situation of human rights in Colombia and the, the development model uh, and the role of the international and domestic private sector. I hadn't come across Padre Ubi's work before um, but it seems to be in a similar mould and uh, it's really quite amazing to, I, I won't read through what he's done, you can see it in your programme, really quite amazing also to have him on the panel. Once again, I'm, I'm, I'm on a panel with people who've had their lives threatened in, in, in the pursuit of human rights, and it's, it's a very humbling experience. But last but not least, Christine also, but it's not someone I've come across before, but looking at her record of work over the last few years, really quite an impressive person as well, so very much looking forward to have her uh, uh, thoughts. So without further ado, shall I ask Padre Ubi to start? Um, just finally, I know that uh, Latin American people find it quite hard to stick to time. <laughs> I'm going to be quite strict, just because it's already going to be 50 minutes of panel sessions, and then I'd really like to get a lot of questions as much as possible from the audience, so um, I'm going to be quite strict. <laughs> Mi nombre es Ulfrido Mayrez Peláez, soy sacerdote católico y defensor de derechos humanos en Oaxaca, México. Represento a este Centro Regional de Derechos Humanos Bartolomé Carrasco Briceño, el cual fundamos hace 19 años. Y voy a hablarles precisamente de la convicción, el compromiso y el riesgo en la promoción y defensa de la dignidad humana. Well, uh, I will try to use these five minutes I have left. Um, my name is uh, Romano Francisco Wilfrido Mayen Pelaez, and I'm a Catholic priest. And I'm representing here the Bartolomé Carrasco Briceño Human Rights Center from Oaxaca, Mexico. 
Um, and I, uh, we created this center 19 years ago, and I will talk to you about the commitment, the risk, and other issues related to uh, the defense of human rights. Los defensores de derechos humanos estamos convencidos de que los derechos humanos deben ser el eje transversal de las políticas públicas de todo gobierno democrático. Pero ahí empieza el problema. Nuestras democracias son de papel, de foto, de discurso, de demagogia. Ese es el caso de nuestro país, un país con 31 estados, un distrito federal, Ahí tenemos ubicado a Oaxaca como el quinto estado más grande del país. Ocupa el 4.8% de su superficie total. Este es problema, es mi intérprete. Bueno, nosotros, como defensores de derechos humanos, estamos convencidos de que los derechos humanos deben ser cross-cutting en toda política pública y en un gobierno democrático. But that's exactly what the problem starts, because our democracies are just paper democracies, uh, fake democracies, just there in theory. And this is what happens in my country, Mexico, where we have 31 states plus a federal district, and the state of Oaxaca is the fifth biggest state with 4.8% uh, of the territory of the country, as you can see in the map. Un país con casi 110 millones de habitantes, en el que oficialmente se reconoce el 60% en pobreza y el 20% en miseria. Comenzando por ahí, imagínense ustedes lo que sigue. So, we're talking about a country of uh, almost 110 million inhabitants, 60% are officially recognized as poor and 20% as living in dire poverty or misery. So, this is how it starts, you can imagine how it starts. Yo vengo de Oaxaca, un estado que está localizado al sur de la República Mexicana y que colinda al norte con los estados de Puebla y Veracruz y al este con Chiapas, al oeste con Guerrero, un estado eminentemente indígena. Well, I come from Oaxaca, as, as in the south of the Mexican Republic, at the north we have the states of Puebla and Veracruz, then we have Chiapas and then we have Guerrero, and it's a state that is made mo mostly an indigenous state. Oaxaca tiene ocho regiones, nosotros trabajamos en la región de la Sierra Sur, ahí en ese tiempo cuando yo llegué en el año 88 a la región de la Sierra Sur, ni siquiera se reconocía la Sierra Sur, era una especie de trampa también del mismo, del propio gobierno, para no hacer partícipe a la región de los recursos necesarios para su desarrollo. Well, in Oaxaca we have eight regions, and uh, I work in the Sierra Sur, and when I arrived there in 1988, uh, this wasn't even recognized as a, as a region, and this was a trap from the government in order for this region not to enjoy the, the use of its resources. No voy a entrar en tanto detalle, pero nada más para que se den una idea, son ocho regiones en las que conviven 16 grupos etnolingüísticos, ahí tienen ustedes los nombres de los grupos de los pueblos indígenas, y el pueblo afrodescendiente, un estado que tiene eh, aproximadamente 3.800.000 habitantes y del cual el 70% son eminentemente indígenas. Well, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we have these eight regions, and in these eight regions we have 50 ethnic groups with different languages, as you can see in the map, and also Afro-descendants. Uh, it's a state where we have 3.8 million people, and 70% uh, of them are indigenous. Es en esta realidad que nosotros trabajamos. Ahí, cuando nos enfrentamos a la miseria, cuando nos enfrentamos a la violencia, cuando nos enfrentamos a la impunidad, cuando nos enfrentamos a la explotación, es cuando nace este Centro Regional de Derechos Humanos Bartolomé Carrasco Diseño, Asociación Civil conocido como Barca, más un movimiento social que intentó generar las condiciones para hacer de que la propia gente se convirtiera en defensor popular, que conociera sus derechos y que aprendieran a defenderlos. Well, 
this is uh, the situation in which we work, and when we started facing all this misery, violence, impunity, exploitation, then we decided to create the Human Rights Centers of Bartolomé Carrasco Diseño, known as BARCA, and we wanted to create like a social movement that would uh, guarantee the conditions so that every person would become like a social fighter, knowing his or her rights and knowing how to defend his or her rights. Tenemos ahí en la foto la imagen del arzobispo Bartolomé Carrasco Briseño, un arzobispo muy comprometido con los pobres, con los indígenas. Justamente por eso quisimos ponerle su nombre a este centro como en honor a él. And in the photograph you can see the um, Archbishop Bartolomé Carrasco Briseño, who was always very committed to the poor, to the indigenous, and that is what why we wanted to honor him by giving the center his name. Y bueno, en Oaxaca en los últimos 18 años se ha agudizado eh, la persecución, el hostigamiento a los defensores de derechos humanos, como en todos los países, ¿verdad? Hemos sido víctimas de difamación, hostigamiento, amenazas, persecución, detención arbitraria, tortura, desaparición, homicidio. Y bueno, la causa eh, es la que ya incluso se había comentado. Cuando nosotros como defensores de derechos humanos hacemos oír nuestra voz, ponemos en entredicho los esquemas tradicionales de poder y entonces enfrentamos la desacreditación, el desdén y el ataque. Well, in, in Oaxaca, in the last 18 years, the situation has become worse and worse in what regards persecution and harassment of human rights defenders. And, uh, Many of us are uh, persecuted, harassed, uh, detained arbitrarily, uh, as, and even assassinated or disappeared. And as it's been said before, what we do with our work is that often we question or we challenge the power schemes, and this is what leads to all these mayor campaigns and all this uh, discreditation that we face. Pero también, gracias a la labor que realizamos los defensores de derechos humanos, se evita que permanezcan ocultos muchos abusos a los derechos humanos. ¿Eh? Y obviamente esto nos enfrenta a los desafíos de los gobiernos, de las élites políticas, militares, policías y poderosos intereses económicos, incluso transnacionales. Muchos se han visto obligados a huir de sus hogares e incluso de su país. But it's also thanks to the work of us as human rights defenders that many of these violations of human rights don't remain hidden. And this is because we have faced what governments and the military and also international or, or national companies try to impose on us. But many human rights defenders have been forced to leave their homes and often also leave their country. Como ustedes han visto en los... Eh, 19 minutos que me quedan ¿verdad? he sido muy rápido <risa> minuto que llevo ya este, hablaré de algunos casos concretos que incluso ustedes conocen en México ser defensor o defensora de derechos humanos implica realmente un grave peligro un grave riesgo quienes trabajamos en temas que van eh, desde temas de asuntos indígenas, medio ambiente derechos de las mujeres dignificación de los campesinos, de los periodistas, de los migrantes, de los indígenas, de los afromexicanos. Diariamente estamos expuestos, recibimos amenazas físicas, psicológicas e incluso eh, nuestros colaboradores, nuestros familiares. Esta situación, lejos de mejorar, cada día empeora. Ahí tenemos algunas fotos que para nosotros en la historia de nuestro país son muy importantes. La foto de Digna Ochoa una abogada eh, reconocida mundialmente que fue asesinada y que el gobierno mexicano dijo que fue un suicidio. Eh, tenemos la foto de Betty Cariño y Giri Yacola, eh, dos defensores de derechos humanos, ella de Oaxaca, él fin, finlandés, que fueron asesinados en una caravana humanitaria que transportaba víveres y medicinas a San Juan Copala en la región Triqui. Y la foto de Brad Wee, un reportero de Intimedia que cubría 
eh, toda la horrible represión que sufrimos en 2006 con el ex gobernador Ulises Ruiz Ortiz. Well, uh, I, I have 90 minutes left. I've been very fast, so I only use one minute. And I will talk to you in these 90 minutes about some very important cases. Um, because in Mexico, being a human rights defender is a very, implies very high risk. Whether we defend the indigenous, the environment, women's rights, the campesino, uh, peasant farmers, journalists, Afro-Mexicans, anyone, every day we suffer physical and psychological threats. And not only us, but also our family and colleagues. And this has worsened with time. And this is why I wanted to show you these photographs of very enigmatic cases in Mexico. We have the photograph of uh, Dina Ochoa, a Mexican lawyer who was assassinated, and uh, the government said she had committed suicide. And we also have um, Betty Carino and Jiri Jacola, who were killed when they were going on a humanitarian car caravan to the tricky region. She came from Oaxaca and he came from Finland. And then we also have Brad Will, who was uh, reporting for Indian, Indian media, and he was giving coverage of the, all the attacks that we suffered in, by the then governor of the Oaxaca state in 2006. Y bueno, aquí yo quisiera, para terminar, platicarles así como de dos casos. Yo, si les platicara, por ejemplo, en, en relación a mi experiencia, tengo 19 años defendiendo los derechos humanos y ha sido un camino terrible de difamación, hostigamiento, persecución, judicialización y criminalización de, de esta tarea, de esta labor de defender los derechos humanos. Ahí en, en, en los textos aparecen como los cinco más significativos, las cinco amenazas y los cinco atentados más significativos que he sufrido, pero solamente les voy a platicar uno, uno mío y uno de, de un compañero sacerdote que ocurrió hace poco. So now to finish, I would like to talk to you about two last cases. And first I would like to talk about my experience in these 19 years that I've been defending human rights. I have had to experience many very terrible situations from harassment all the way to being um, criminalized and sent to trial uh, unfairly. And in the text you can see the five most uh, representative attacks I've suffered, but I would like to talk to you about one in particular and also about something that happened to uh, a priest uh, friend. Cuando nosotros en la Sierra Sur enfrentamos el poder de la persona que mantenía el control económico, político y social de la zona, era el único que tenía la tienda y era el único que compraba lo que producía la gente, Jamaica y café. Entonces nosotros empezamos a crear cooperativas, cajas populares, y eso nos enfrentó, nos confrontó con el cacique. Él sintió que se le derrumbaba y se le derrumbó su imperio, ¿verdad? Entonces me empezó a acusar, eran tiempos de levantamiento zapatista, me empezó a acusar que yo era comandante zapatista, que estaba armando a la región, eh, al grado que incluso el gobernador de ese tiempo pues me echó al ejército, el ejército llegó, hizo operativos de rastrillaje buscando con lupa en, la, en toda la, en la sierra, mis campos de entrenamiento, eh, cuando no los encontró después de 15 días eh, me rodeó el curato y entonces eh, me interrogó de dónde estaban mis campos de entrenamiento y yo le dije, bueno, buscaron en el monte, no están ahí, están aquí ahí está el cuartito donde hacíamos los retiros, los cursos de derechos humanos ese y la iglesia, esos son mis campos de entrenamiento es que hemos tenido noticias que has estado metiendo armas de alto poder así ah, es, efectivamente, aquí está la Biblia la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos la Constitución, estas son las armas de alto poder que hemos estado metiendo y todo esto aunado al ataque del cacique y porque acompañamos al pueblo de Saniza, el pueblo de Saniza, un pueblo indígena zapoteco que se opuso a la entrada de la compañía acerera del norte que quería hacer la extracción de la mina más grande de fierro en Latinoamérica que está en Santa María Saniza 
y que quieren hacer una extracción hacia el gobierno. Well, um, in the Sierra Sur, we started facing the man who had all the power, both political, economical power. He owned the shop, and he was the one buying all that our products, which were hibiscus and coffee. So we started creating, creating cooperatives, and he became uh, very angry, and he really felt that his empire was crumbling, and it did crumble. So he started accusing me of being a Zapatista commander, because it was in the times of the Zapatista uprising, and he also said that I was trying to arm the region. So the governor at the time sent uh, the army against me, and they started to look bit by bit all around the Sierra, trying to find my training camps. And after 15 days, they didn't find anything. So they came to my to my priesthood and said, uh, "Where is where are your training camps?" And I said, "Well, you've looked everywhere, but here they are. Here we have the small room where we do our um, religious retires and the human rights courses, and also uh, where we have our cursive courses. And then they, here is the church as well." And they said, "But we heard that you've been arming the whole population with very uh, strong weapons." And he said, yes, you heard well, I have the Bible, the Human Rights uh, Declaration, and the Constitution. So, the Casipi was also trying to fight against me because uh, we were trying to, we were together with uh, the Zapote community, defending the community of San, San Isa, uh, where they wanted to put a big uh, iron, a big iron company wanted to do some open mines in the area, some of the biggest in the country, and we were fighting against it. Desde entonces, la gente del gobierno, los poderosos en Oaxaca, me apodan así, el cura guerrillero, ¿no? el comandante zapatista. Pero como no consiguieron nada, a pesar de una campaña muy fuerte en los medios de comunicación y con la presión del ejército y la policía, entonces eh, un grupo paramilitar del cacique eh, atentó contra mi vida el 8 de octubre del año 2008. Yo iba en compañía de dos eh, catequistas de mi parroquia y me tiraron eh, este, en, cuando yo iba caminando por, por la sierra. Well, um, since then, the government and the the powerful people have been calling me the guerrillero priest, the Zapatista priest. Uh, but uh, despite all the campaigns they carried out in the media, they tried to send the police, the military against me because they didn't manage to do anything. They sent the paramilitary. And on the 8th of October 2008, when I was with two other people from my parish, they uh, attempted against uh, my life. Pero también ahí comenzó otra historia. Cuando nosotros acompañamos al pueblo de San Isa a defender su territorio, eh, documentamos todo, eh, solamente en la etapa, todavía no de extracción, sino de exploración, se modificaron los mantos acuíferos, se contaminó el río con aceite, eh, el, el nivel de alcoholismo y de prostitución subió de manera increíble, la violencia. Entonces todo eso lo documentamos y, y eso fue un motivo para impedir que continuara el proyecto. But this is when another story starts because when we were defending the town of San Isa, uh, trying to defend the land, the, only during uh, we were documenting everything and this was only the exploration phase. They hadn't started with the extraction and we realized that the the, the, there had been already pollution of the rivers, there had been a, a high increase of alcoholism, violence, prostitution, and thanks to all this that we had very carefully documented, they did not go ahead with the project. Y finalmente les comento el, 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 lo que tuvo que vivir mi compañero, el padre Martín Octavio García Ortiz en San José del Progreso, el 19 de julio del 2010 en Oaxaca por acompañar a esta comunidad en la defensa de, de sus tierras, porque ahí quiere entrar una compañía canadiense, la minera Cuscatlán. Eh, y bueno, todo lo que significa la explotación, el uso del cianuro para la separación del oro, 
la contaminación de, de las aguas. Entonces el padre eh, acompañó y hizo venir a especialistas de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México para que hablaran a la gente sobre los beneficios, pero también sobre los perjuicios de una explotación minera. Ese fue su delito, hubo eh, después un conflicto armado, hubo un, dos homicidios y él sin saber ni enterarse de lo que pasó, lo culparon de eso, un grupo del PRI afín a la mina y al ex gobernador, lo secuestró, lo torturó, ahí están, ustedes pueden ver cómo lo visité, eh, lo llevaron a la cárcel, ¿no? lo golpearon, le, le destrozaron la, la cabeza, aquí a un lado del, del oído, en, en las manos donde lo, lo tuvieron atado, está la sangre en su pantalón y es un hecho que solamente por después, tres meses después, logramos demostrar que era inocente, que él eh, no tenía nada que ver en, en los homicidios, que era simplemente criminalizar la labor de un defensor del medio ambiente y hasta la fecha lo que a él le hicieron sigue impune. And finally, I would like to tell you what happened to a dear friend of mine, Father Martín Octavio García Ortiz, from San José del Progreso. And this happened to him on the 19th of June, 2010. And he had been uh, accompanying the community there because they were against uh, the, a Canadian company that wanted to settle there. And because of different uh, situations, the pollution of the rivers, the cyanide that was used to separate gold, And uh, because of this, uh, at the time, they, they were, there was violence and two people were killed. And the PRI, the party uh, in power in the region, accused him of those killings. And they kidnapped him, they tortured him, and I visited him in prison. And you could see in the photographs the state of his face, his ears. Uh, you could see where his hands had been tied, the blood on his trousers. and. Um, And all this, uh, after um, uh, three months, we managed to prove that he was innocent. But um, this is what happened. This is the criminalization that defenders of uh, environmental rights suffer. Y aquí es para donde nosotros adquiere un sentido profundo y muy importante el acompañamiento de brigadas internacionales de, de, de la paz. Para nosotros. Los que nos dedicamos a la defensa de los derechos humanos, yo diría, lo resumo en esas dos frases, son como nuestros ángeles de la guarda, ¿no? como los guardaespaldas de la paz. Sin ellos, sin su presencia, sin su acompañamiento protectivo, muchos de nosotros o estaríamos en la cárcel o estaríamos muertos. And this is where PBI's accompaniment becomes so important for us, because for us fighting for uh, human rights, PBI are, uh, the people from PBI are what I like to call our guardian angels or the um, or peace uh, bodyguards and without them many of us will be or in prison or dead. Le cedo a mis compañeros los 15 minutos de los que ya no hice uso. <laughs> Now I will give all those 15 minutes I can use to my friends. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Procuraré ser equitativo y dejar unos minutos para que En Colombia hemos podido caracterizar cinco prácticas de las empresas multinacionales especialmente relacionadas con la extracción de minerales y de hidrocarburos. Vamos a mirar lentamente esas prácticas y las consecuencias que tienen en Colombia para los defensores de derechos humanos. En primer lugar, debemos señalar que son empresas que son usufructuarias de la represión, que han venido beneficiándose de la represión que se ha ejercido 
especialmente en las zonas rurales. En los últimos 30 años, más de 5 millones de personas han sido expulsadas de sus lugares de origen, han sido obligadas al desplazamiento forzado. So just to be fair, I will uh, leave some time for Christine to speak after me. Um, in Colombia, there are five main practices being carried out by multinational companies, especially in relation to the extraction of minerals and hydrofuels. Um, I'd like to go through these practices and then talk about the consequences which these practices have on human rights defenders. Firstly, these bit these businesses are the main benefactors of the repression being exerted, especially in rural areas. And over the past 30 years, 5 million people have been expelled from their land of origin and have suffered forced displacement. A partir de este desplazamiento forzado a comunidades indígenas, afrodescendientes y campesinos, les han sido robados más de 6 millones y medio de hectáreas de territorio. Han sido despojados de sus tierras, de sus propiedades. Es preocupante ver en el mapa, en la parte azul, aparece la coincidencia de los lugares del desplazamiento forzado con los lugares donde hoy las multinacionales de la minería y de los hidrocarburos están pidiendo permisos de exploración y de explotación. En rojo encontrarán donde no existe desplazamiento, sino que solo existen permisos. Yo sé que todos están buscando el color rojo. Sí. Sí. of their land. They have lost 6.5 million hectares of land. They have been dispossessed of their land and their property. It's very worrying to see on the map the blue areas where there is a strict, uh, a very close link between uh, the areas where forced displacement has taken place and where the mining companies are trying to uh, gain permits in order to explore for their resources. Um, in the areas of the, the red on the map, uh, the areas where there is no forced displacement and where only grants have been uh, permitted, but I can see that we're all looking for the red areas on this map. Al final vamos a otorgar un premio que encuentre el rojo. En ese contexto, para nosotros es sumamente preocupante ver cómo de, de, de 100 municipios donde las empresas piden permiso, en 99 las personas han sido desplazadas y sus propiedades han sido robadas. Vemos que esas empresas vienen a beneficiarse de esos crímenes anteriores. Y eso es lo que nos permite hoy ver lo que acaba de documentar e informar el PNUD, el Plan de Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo. El PNUD acaba de decir que el índice máximo de concentración de la tierra es de un número, de un punto. Hoy en Colombia el índice de concentración de la tierra es de 0,875 puntos. Por eso Naciones Unidas ha concluido recientemente que Colombia es de los países con las tasas más altas de desigualdad en América de, de, más, las tasas más altas de desigualdad de la propiedad rural en América Latina y en el mundo y en dicho contexto es preocupante ver que pasamos del año 2002 donde existían permisos para exploración y explotación de minas en 1.500.000 hectáreas al año 2009, donde existen solicitudes y permisos por 8 millones y medio de hectáreas. Casi que esa relación entre desplazados, tierras robadas y 
concentración de la propiedad resulta ser claramente proporcional. Adicionalmente, estas empresas como usufructuarias de la represión, es habitual que las manifestaciones que se dan por parte de comunidades o sindicatos en contra de sus actividades sean fuertes reprimidas por parte de miembros de la fuerza pública. Son numerosas las personas o que resultan muertas o que resultan con graves lesiones en su cuerpo por oponerse a las multinacionales. Out of the um, requests made by the multinational businesses to uh, set up their industries in 99% of cases, this leads to forced displacement. And therefore, these businesses really are benefiting from uh, criminal acts carried out. Now, you can see the UNDP has created an index relating to land concentration. And the index, uh, the, to the highest level is one point. And you can see that the land concentration in Colombia amounts to 0.875 points. And therefore, based on these findings, the UN has concluded that in Colombia there's one of the highest levels of inequality when it comes to rural property uh, land in Latin America and in the world. So this uh, is extremely alarming also if we look at how in 2002, the permits granted for exploration of mineral uh, of mining resources was 1.5 million uh, hectares of uh, land, which was granted. And in 2009, there have been requests for 8.5 million hectares of land to be used for this type of exploration. And therefore, we can see that there is a relation between forced displacement and these permits being granted. So in terms of the repression uh, which is uh, exerted against people who protest against these multinationals or trade unions who are opposed, the forms of repression which they experience are extremely um, strong when it comes to the authorities repressing them. They are either killed or in many cases very severely injured just because they are protesting against these multinationals. Una segunda variable que hemos podido constatar y comprobar es que las multinacionales han contribuido a la privatización de las fuerzas de policía y fuerzas militares en Colombia. Estas empresas llegan y donde quieren desarrollar sus proyectos contratan directamente con los batallones del ejército su protección. Hemos conocido casos como en el sur de Bolívar, donde uno de los líderes y que era amigo personal Alejandro Uribe fue asesinado después de que 12 días antes denunciamos la persecución en su contra. El presidente de esta misma asociación de Fede Agromisbol, Teófilo Acuña, fue detenido. En el caso de Alejandro le dieron cinco disparos por la espalda, cuatro de ellos hechos a menos de un metro de distancia y se dijo que había muerto en combate. Los argumentos en los dos casos, según los informes de inteligencia del ejército colombiano, venían participando en reuniones para impedir el ingreso de la multinacional Anglo Gol a Chandi. Uh, these multinationals are also privatizing, contributing to the privatization of the police and army forces in Colombia. So these businesses arrive and then they directly contract uh, people from the army battalions so as to provide protection and security for the businesses. Um, this, there's a case in the area of Sur de Bolívar where a friend of mine, Alejandro, Alejandro Uribe, was killed after he denounced the persecution uh, against him. Uh, there was an agricultural uh, federation of which he was uh, part and Alejandro was shot five times. 
four of the bullets uh, which he received were uh, shot at him when he was standing less than a metre away from his killer. And yet it was said that he had died in combat. So according uh, to the army intelligence in relation to this particular case, it was said that he was trying to prevent the uh, business, multinational business Anglo Cola Chanti from entering into the area. Un tercer nivel de participación es estas empresas son determinadoras directas de clientes. Estas empresas han auspiciado que grupos privados que cuentan con el apoyo del Estado participen en actos de asesinatos de sindicalistas en Colombia. Se ha denunciado el papel de la multinacional del carbón de humo, el papel de Coca-Cola y recientemente un comandante paramilitar contó como personal de Ocenza, de la cual hace parte la BP, pagado más de 40 mil euros para asesinar a Gilberto Torres Martínez, un dirigente sindical de la USA. Pero además de pagar por los crímenes directamente, estas multinacionales en Colombia han pagado especie de impuestos a los paramilitares para que brinden seguridad. En el caso del Urabá, multinacionales del banano como la Chiquita Brand, por cada caja de banano que salía de Colombia, pagaban 50 centavos de dólar que iban con destino a las arcas de los paramilitares. So the multinationals' participation in these uh, criminal activities takes place on three main levels. Um, they support private uh, groups who, who are also supported by the state when it comes to killing trade unionists. Um, there is a specific case where a military commander was actually paid 40,000 euros in order to assassinate a uh, trade unionist leader, and there have been links between paramilitary groups and other companies such as Coca-Cola and Ocensa, which is also supported by BP. So not only have these multinational, not multinationals been funding the crimes, but they've also been paying taxes for the military and helping the, in giving money to the military so that the military can provide protection for them. There was another case uh, relating to Uraba, the business whereby these a uh, certain amount of money, 50 cents, was being paid for every box of bananas which were being sold, which then went to fund a specific paramilitary group, the Araka. Finalmente, como una de las prácticas que ya relataba y describía en América Latina el señor relator sobre la situación de pueblos indígenas en el mundo, es la vulneración del derecho a la consulta, que es absolutamente burlado en Colombia. El Estado ha permitido que sean las mismas multinacionales las que dirijan las consultas. Cuando yo soy el que quiero beneficiarme y dirijo una consulta, en la consulta resulta siendo de entrada una burla al derecho de los pueblos indígenas y de los pueblos afrodescendientes. Según hemos conocido casos como el de la toma en el norte del Cauca, donde la multinacional Anglo Bolachanti citó a una asamblea a la comunidad para informarles del proyecto. Allí en la asamblea circuló una hoja en blanco para que las personas firmaran su asistencia a la asamblea. Después llevó estas hojas firmadas ante las autoridades diciendo que la consulta había sido aprobada. Esto pues vemos que viola abiertamente el derecho a la consulta que tienen tanto los pueblos indígenas como las comunidades afrodescendientes, pero que además... Muchas veces estas consultas 
están precedidas de actos de amenaza, de presión, de hostigamiento o de militarización de las comunidades. Es recurrente que cuando se van a iniciar estos proyectos de exploración o de explotación, se militaricen las comunidades o se paramilitaricen, generando actos de intimidación, presión, amenazas, ataques o persecución a las comunidades o sus líderes. Finally, another practice which has already been mentioned earlier this morning is the violation of the right to consultation, which is truly laughable in Colombia. Um, what happens is that the multinationals are actually leading the consultations. So what happens is when I want to benefit uh, from the, the deal, the consultation itself is rendered completely laughable and therefore the rights of the indigenous and um, Afro-descendants is violated. There was an example in the north of Cauca where the Corporation anglo Achanti convened an assembly which was going to inform the indigenous communities on the project which they had in mind. So they passed around a blank sheet of paper and people went to sign, just having stated that they attended the assembly. And then this very sheet of paper with all the signatures was presented to the authorities and stated as proof that the consultation had been approved. So this constitutes a direct violation of the indigenous people's rights. And not only this, but before these consultations actually take place, Threats are carried out against the communities, there are cases of harassment or militarization of the land. So when a project is being announced, just before the project actually happened, there is either militarization or paramilitarization of the land, which leads to increased pressure on the community, threats being, ca being carried out, and attacks being carried out on the indigenous communities. This is a context that ante multinacionales o transnacionales de la muerte y del terror. Y en ese contexto, ya lo decía Cristina Internacional hace algunos años, defender los derechos humanos en Colombia es una profesión de alto riesgo. Hoy tengo que recordar, siendo yo abogado, un amigo abogado que fue desaparecido en estas luchas en el año 90, al inicio de Jesús Pedraza, tengo que recordar a quien fue mi maestro, Eduardo Maña Mendoza, que el 19 de abril del año 98 fue asesinado dentro de su oficina. O tengo que recordar a Jesús María Valle, con quien participábamos en tareas conjuntamente, quien también fue asesinado días antes en la ciudad de Medellín. Hoy en Colombia, el último reporte de los organismos de derechos humanos indica que entre el 1 de enero y el 31 de junio del año 2011 se presentaron 145 agresiones contra defensores de derechos humanos. De esas 145 agresiones en seis meses, 29 fueron asesinados. Es decir, que en Colombia un defensor de derechos humanos está siendo agredido cada 29 horas y cada seis días uno está siendo asesinado. Es frecuente y ha sido en los últimos años que la labor de los defensores sea sometida a permanente espionaje, ingresos subrepticios a las oficinas, robos de, de información de los computadores, revisión de las bolsas de basura de las casas y oficinas con el propósito de recaudar información, amenazas a los familiares, persecuciones, desde agencias del mismo Estado, desde el Departamento Administrativo de Seguridad, han sido una práctica permanente. Durante la administración del presidente Uribe, existieron cinco directores del Servicio de Inteligencia. Hoy, cinco de esos directores están siendo objeto de investigación por el espionaje contra periodistas, magistrados de la Corte Suprema, y defensores de derechos humanos. Uno tiene que decir conforme al derecho internacional 
o el presidente Uribe vivía bajo una situación de estupidez crónica que no, no le permitió ver que cinco de las personas que, de las cinco que él nombró estaban delinquiendo en su casa o fue cómplice y determinador de estas acciones criminales. Uh, two years ago, a security study was carried out on me, even though 
I hadn't had any um, direct attacks being brought against me at the time. And it concluded that I was at especially high risk. Uh, when I asked uh, where the risk was coming from, it said that the information in that report was confidential and therefore they couldn't divulge that information to me. Uh, last year, uh, the head of the human rights uh, program where I work uh, stated that my life was in grave danger and there was a lawyer who was particularly worried as they thought that I may be killed in a matter of days. So I would like to uh, stress the importance of the role of the PBI in my work. They have accompanied me to hearings, um, court rulings, they've also been with me when I've been travelling to the city and also within the country. And I think that this international solidarity is increasingly needed to help maintain the work carried out by human rights defenders in Colombia. And hopefully that will mean that we will be able to put an end to a situation where we will no longer have to live in fear and where there will no longer be so many people who have disappeared. There's 57,200 people who have disappeared in the country. That's more than under the Chilean dictatorship or the Argentinian dictatorship. And this has occurred whilst we were in a democracy. So my question is, what would have happened if we weren't living in a democracy? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge. That, that brings us neatly on to Christine. We've heard from Padre Ubi about the challenges at a local, regional level. All here works at a national level uh, on, on, as a lawyer. So let's ask Christine, uh, who, who apart from being worked for PBI, is also the um, chair of the Canadian Peace Alliance. What, what do you think uh, is the role of international organizations to support this work? Um, thank you. I will not take 10 minutes because I think it's really important that we get to uh, our participatory stage. I'm sure lots of you would like the opportunity to speak with some pretty amazing defenders that we have here today. Um, the first thing that uh, I wanted to just do an overview of quite quickly is to give a little bit of a context of how Peace Brigades International works. Because while we've heard about the importance that it plays in keeping human rights defenders alive and safe and in their community. I can tell you as a staff person at Peace Brigades International, one of the first questions I always get is, yes, but how does it work? How does the dissuasion happen? So I thought I would share what I affectionately call my elevator speech with you, which is to try and explain how PBI functions in about three minutes. Um, and it's not just songs, so no worries. So Peace Brigades um, International works to ensure that threatened human rights defenders are protected and to ensure that they're not alone and to ensure that they're not isolated and in fact to ensure that we are all together part of an international community that works to support each other in the ways that we can depending on where we live. So for example, the work in Canada, one of the ways that we work to support the human rights defenders that our colleagues in the field protect is we do advocacy work, we do public, public awareness raising events, we meet with members of parliament, we meet with members of civil society, we meet with politicians who probably don't want to meet with us. This is actually a significant key to what we need to do because not only do our volunteers in the field who do the physical accompaniment work with defenders actively keep space open for political work, but we, when we meet with governments and when we meet with companies, we are also actively keeping space open for human rights work. Because these companies and these politicians, especially the politicians increasingly, actually don't want us to be there. They don't want us talking about things. They don't want to have to hear the realities of what their policies and what their legislation and what their corporations are doing. So I think it's really important to understand the context of Peace Brigades, not as an isolated activity that happens in one place or another, but it's actually a collective act of activity that happens in many different places with the singular goal 
of making sure that human rights are respected, that human rights defenders work is considered and recognized as legitimate, and with the single goal of making sure that all of our human rights are respected and are considered legitimate. I think that when I considered the birth of PBI 30 years ago in Canada, I didn't actually realize how much of a significant role Peace Brigades had actually played in the social movement in Canada until I started to work in other areas of political activism. And through my non-day job with the peace and anti-war movement in Canada, I quickly came to recognize the importance that Peace Brigades had had both in Canada but internationally when I would continually come across either human rights defenders who were, that we accompanied in the field in Guatemala, now living in Canada, who were participating in demonstrations to stop the war in Afghanistan, or when I did meet different members of the founding committee of Peace Brigades sitting around the table, helping us try to decide how we work to make sure that Canada does not criminalize Canadians for speaking out against the abuses that the Israeli government does in, in Palestine. So I think the importance of the role of internationality in the work of PBI should not be just understood to where we have historically had our field presence but actually understanding the work of PBI in a way as an incubator of really strong, committed, connected global peace activists and human rights activists. I think the other significant role that I do understand from my experience with PBI is that human rights work isn't just an isolated, separate entity of a peace movement or of a social justice movement. Just like the defenders that Jorge uh, represents, the, the trade unionists that Jorge represents, aren't just acting in a very specific field, but actually, collectively, we are a global movement. And I think when we are able to contextualize the experience of the defense of human rights outside of just the, the realities in northern countries and the realities in southern countries, it actually then becomes a much more powerful experience of collectivity and international solidarity. The most profound thing that Peace Brigades International, I think, can support with regards to the international human rights movement is one, we make sure that human rights defenders can stay alive and stay in their countries and build their democracies and seek the justice that is necessary for all of those cases of impunity. We also make sure that by the end of a person's term and commitment with Peace Brigades, providing accompaniment, accompaniment or work in one of our offices doing advocacy, we have incredibly highly trained and skilled volunteers who then go out into a variety of other organizations and a variety of other places throughout political structures and social movement structures. And maybe the third most important thing is that Peace Brigades provides an opportunity for us to learn from each other and to learn quite viscerally the experiences of some human rights defenders who have had to live under repression that many of us thankfully only imagine or only have to hear, hear about in, in a second-hand way. This is important because those of us that haven't lived in countries with this level of repression are actually quickly moving towards a slippery slope. And I want to talk about Canada because I actually think this is extremely important and I'm getting the, the, the finger, so... Not the finger, <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, no justification, but my time is almost finished. Um, Canada is a linchpin to what we see going on globally with regards to repression of human rights defenders. It is significant that the tar stands are happening in Canada that was mentioned earlier with not just the support but actually the funding of our government. It is significant that many of us who work to stop the tar sands in Canada and to stop the mining that is happening in Canada are being criminalized 
in many of the same ways, though not to the same death level that happens in many of the countries that we've heard. And it's also significant to realize that the companies that are doing the mining extraction and the extractive industries in places like Colombia and Guatemala and Mexico are actually effecting the same horrendous um, uh, attitudes towards our own indigenous communities in Canada. It's really important to realize that in fact what's happened is regimes and companies have, have practiced and perfected their levels of repression in some places and what they're now doing is they're allowing it to migrate from country to country to country. And I think it's specifically important that we understand the role of trade deals in all of this. There's the Canada-European trade deal which is happening, which is again going to be the linchpin to ensure that between Canada and Europe, companies and governments are now afforded an open and an extremely convenient trade route for extractive industries. And finally, I want to just say that the level of criminalization that all of us are now um, experiencing is not just happenstance. This is extremely coordinated and it's extremely embedded in the trade deals that so many of us have seen our country signing. And finally, just on the level of internationality, it's not an organization that does the work to protect human rights defenders. And it's not a, a single organization that ensures that the voice of human rights defenders is heard, is heard around the world. It's actually those of us who participate in these spaces. It's every single one of us. And we actually have a significant responsibility to make sure that what we learn here, we take out into those other spaces and into those other aspects of social movements where we may be present. Because the corporate media actually doesn't want to hear this. We are our own media and we are the ones that have to make sure that the voices and the realities of the human rights defenders around the world are Thank you. We've also heard some of the issues that surround uh, this debate, finally from Christine, some, some issues at an international level, including trade deals. We talked about consultation, or when I worked with this a few years ago, there was even the phrase free prior informed consent. I don't know if that's now gone off the agenda. Um, things like protection measures that Jorge talked about, the relationship between a particular development model, thank you, uh, both at the international and a national level, and human rights abuses and threats to human rights defenders. Please feel free to ask, obviously, whatever you, you wish to ask. It's not often that we get a chance to, to speak with people on, on this panel. Uh, but I would remind you that what we're trying to do is link the experiences of human rights defenders with the issue of land, uh, with the issue of resources, which is something that it's quite hard to do. I really respect the idea of trying to do it. It's, life is so busy working in human rights, simply defending people's rights to get on and live. But actually, to look at the bigger issues is actually quite hard, both in terms of having money and time to do it. So I think if we can try and focus on those issues, I think that would be ideal. So we'll take like um, you know two or three questions, and then we'll come back to the panel and see how see how we can do it. I know everyone wants to have a nice coffee, um, but, but I think it's also important to try and have a chat with the people on the panel. So maybe we've got 15 minutes uh, roughly. So who would like to to ask the first question? Is there microphones, or do we just speak loudly? Just speak loudly. Gentlemen over there. Uh, hi, thank you very much. I'd like to ask the two gentlemen from uh, Colombia and Mexico uh, whether you, um, what kind of contact have you had with governments, with foreign governments in your countries, foreign embassies, the European Union, uh, to explain what's happening and to try and seek their support uh, for your cause. And you are? Uh, Tom Kennedy from the Foreign Office. Thanks very much. So, if, if people could please just uh, um, introduce themselves. 
la idea. Ah, yes. Hago la pregunta en, en español. Eh, mi nombre es Patricia Riva y trabajo en la Amnistía Internacional. Y quería hacerle una pregunta a Jorge, específicamente con respecto al proceso de consulta. Eh, cuando nos explicás que la consulta es en práctica puesta en manos de las empresas mismas, que es una, una contradicción inherente en, en cuanto a los intereses que representan. Quería hacerte la pregunta en el contexto colombiano, pero en muchos otros contextos en Latinoamérica, ¿hasta qué punto podemos confiar en poner la consulta en manos de la, del Estado? Sobre todo en el contexto del Estado mexicano o colombiano. Y, eh, y, si, y si no confiamos, como puede seguramente ser la respuesta, entonces ¿cuál es la solución desde su punto de vista? The, well, just, just quickly, the lady from Amnesty International question is directed to Jorge in particular and it's about the issue of free prior informed consent. All we would say is currently more or less in the hands of the companies themselves to ensure that it happens. And the question is, should, should it be in the hands of the state? And even then, is that really going to solve the problem? To what extent we can trust the state? Um, should, should, it, um, should, should it be in the hands of the state? And finally, a gentleman there, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yeah, this is, my name's Richard Sonny from London Mining Network. This is on the same point that's just been made, free prior informed consent, and I welcome comments from, um, from Jorge and, and Jorge Uri. I was at a meeting sometime last year uh, in the House of Lords with representatives of Rio Tinto, and there was a Rio Tinto representative from Colombia who said he had been at a meeting in Bogota with industry and government people who had all agreed that free prior informed consent for indigenous people was a good idea that they fully supported. And what it meant was that no NGOs or outside organisations should have any contact with the indigenous people's concern <laughs> while they were making their decision because it would simply confuse them. But it was only a question of the government and the company telling the people what would happen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. So I'll, I'll ask Jorge to respond first, as, as a lot of those questions were, were directed to you. Then we'll ask Padre if he has anything to add. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, I think there were various considerations in relation to the theme of the consult. The traditional practice that seems to be a bit in relation to the last question is that these companies come to the communities con algunos euros para ser ofrecidos especialmente a los líderes en la perspectiva de sobornarlos y romper la unidad de los procesos organizativos y de las mismas comunidades. De pronto en algunas oportunidades eh, avanzan ofreciendo un pequeño puesto de salud sin ninguna dotación como mecanismo para que se entienda que va a llegar al desarrollo. Es decir, que podríamos entender que, que son prácticas casi que se suelen vivir en nuestros países en los periodos de campañas electorales, donde se llevan unas tejas y algunas cosas para ir garantizando eh, el favor del voto, del sufragio. Entonces, precisamente cuando se busca y se quiere que no esté nadie diferente a las comunidades, lo que, se, lo que se pretende también es lograr que sean consultas fácilmente manipulables y objeto de manipulación sin ningún tipo de observación ni de verificación, y menos aún de ningún tipo de asesoría hacia las propias comunidades. Nosotros creemos que, igual que, que lo haga el Estado, podemos llegar a resultados muy parecidos, no creemos que vayan a ser muy visibles, creemos que en ese marco en que existan niveles de verificación y observación de, las, de los procesos de consulta son sumamente importantes. Tanto México como Colombia cuentan ya con oficinas del alto comisionado de manera permanente. El papel que pueda cumplirse en el monitoreo y observación de las consultas desde la comunidad internacional puede ser un mecanismo que imprima los niveles de objetividad, de independencia. Y, tristemente, lo que uno observa es que los funcionarios públicos, eh, muchas veces por el afán de, de recaudar recursos, no tienen en cuenta todos los componentes ni de la consulta ni de la legislación. Por ejemplo, hoy en Colombia, 
existen 34 parques naturales son zonas de alta biodiversidad zonas de, de nacimiento de las fuentes de agua en específico estamos hablando de, de esos 34 donde están los nacimientos de los ríos ya se han otorgado permisos para hacer minería a cielo abierto en 22 de los parques naturales cuando el mundo está preocupado por el tema del calentamiento global por el, la conservación de los recursos el Estado está más preocupado por mirar cómo entregarnos. Y en relación con el tema de las embajadas, pues nosotros mantenemos una interlocución permanente con muchas de las embajadas, en términos de estar informando y documentando la situación, planteando la preocupación sobre el papel directo de empresas que se viene teniendo en cada uno de los casos donde intervenimos, e inclusive creemos que ha sido muy positivo observar que, que muchas de estas embajadas han empezado a hacer eh, aplicación de las directivas de la, de la Unión Europea en relación con el acompañamiento también en las audiencias, en los juicios. Eh, no sabemos qué tan efectivas sean las acciones frente a sus empresas, que en algún momento podemos tener dudas por cuanto no hemos visto cambios en los comportamientos y en las prácticas de estas empresas. Pero creemos que en términos de bueno, la, la incidencia en, ante el Estado en materia de protección por parte del cuerpo diplomático es un elemento que es importante, en el cual también la labor de, de PBI y otras organizaciones en cada uno de los países y ante las cancillerías, como indicaba Cristín, se resultan ser elementos bastante importantes y disuasores. question about con consultation. What normally happens is that these businesses arrive, they arrive in the communities with some money which they try and offer the indigenous leaders, so to try and bribe them. And they do this so in order to break the unity of the community. They then offer, for example, uh, to put up a health centre which doesn't actually have any resources in it, but it's as if it's a promise of future development. And what they're doing there was a strategy similar to uh, what they use in electoral campaigns where they try and buy people's votes. Uh, also, when it comes to these uh, consultations, there is very little observation of the consultation processes, no verification of data, and there is there are no consultancy services uh, offered to the indigenous communities. So, as to whether if we should trust the state, if they were to get involved, the situation would be very similar, I think. But what is important is that we have international uh, community support. For example, we have the High Commissioner, who is permanent officer, both in Colombia and Mexico, and they play a very important role in ensuring monitoring and evaluation of these consultation uh, processes. So the intervention of the international community could really help in trying to ensure that these consultation processes are more objective in nature. Um, the public officials in our country, however, seem to be more obsessed with collecting funds rather than looking at the detail of uh, a specific project. So we have 34 national parks in our country, just to give you an example, with very uh, rich biodiversity in these parks. And out of the 34 parks that we have, 22 parks have been affected by grants uh, given to mining companies who are now going to exploit this land. The embassies, in relation to the other uh, question, we are in constant dialogue with foreign embassies and they are helping us try and document and register all the data which we collect when we uh, take on certain cases. The embassies have also started to apply EU directives when it comes to providing accompaniment to hearings. However, we've not really seen um, the fruits of this labor because the businesses continue behaving in the way that they do. However, um, 
I would like to say to get the importance of PBI and other international organizations who could try and keep the state in check when it comes to these practices. Okay, what I'm going to do is take a couple more quick questions. I'll come back to uh, you, Madre, um, in the next round. And especially if you can think about what Richard asked about the role of uh, NGOs in, in, the, in the information process and whether that is how to manage that. I'm really sorry, the kind of tra tra translation means that everything takes twice as long, so but we'll take that question, that question, Louise, and then, and then we'll have to just come back to the panel. Yes, please. Uh, this is Susie Bascon, uh, from Investigation to Manage Reception. I would like to ask Jorge Molano and Padre Rui uh, whether they can tell us in which way the international community could help them to ensure that their work and the lives are more protected. So they can give us some examples of ideas on how we can contribute to our responsibility and decisions that we can make. Did everyone hear that? Yeah. How can the international community help to protect human rights defenders such as Jorge and Padre, Ubi, um, and some critiques some also come back on? Uh, there was another question just here. Yes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Charles Rogers from the Mineral Policy Institute. Uh, very interesting, you mentioned the companies trying to divide communities um, and I see that often where we work in Papua New Guinea in particular it often leads to death and by um, exacerbating conflict within communities and I wondered if you developed ways of um, trying to combat that because it's a deliberate strategy used by multinationals so I wondered if you could share either of you your experience on combating that intentional division. Thank you. Hey, Ruth and Sally from AB Columbia. Um, I wondered if Jorge might um, expand a little bit um, around the situation you talked about, about forced displacement. And I am, now there's a victim's law which will restore territory, although I know it's only about 2 million hectare acres out of the 6 million, 6.5 million you mentioned to, to territories. But how this... <coughs> kind of coincides with the National Development Plan, which is to really plough ahead as a major engine in terms of uh, extractives. How the two things marry together, if you're trying to return land to people who've been forcibly displaced, and many of them in the areas where there are uh, extractive concessions, and how that's going to be impacted on with a major driver of, um, of um, supporting extractives in the country. If you just permit me one quick other question. Um, the environmental impact studies that are done, I understand that those are actually often done after the exploration stage instead of before it. And I'm wondering how much, if those um, impact studies were done prior to that, they could form part of an informed consent process with Indigenous peoples. Thank you very much, Louise. I'm afraid you're not going to get very long answers today. But, um, hopefully around coffee and also, of course, Professor and I will also be around to answer some of those questions. Um, uh, 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 I've also already answered, so I'm going to ask Padre Gubi first um, to ask some of those questions. Yeah. Yo creo que la comunidad internacional, pues, efectivamente, tiene mucho que hacer, especialmente en la exigencia a sus gobiernos, a sus embajadas, eh, pues, para que haya mayor coherencia entre cooperación y proyectos de desarrollo, por ejemplo, la exigencia de la aplicación de los estándares y de los protocolos internacionales, eh, de los mecanismos que protegen a los defensores de derechos humanos, eh, exigiendo el cumplimiento de sentencias, en el caso de nosotros en Oaxaca hubo una recomendación de la Comisión Nacional de Derechos Humanos por los actos represivos del 2006 que no, a la que no se dio cumplimiento hubo un resolutivo de la Suprema Corte de Justicia de la Nación que tampoco fue atendida entonces yo creo que hay muchas cosas en las que ustedes también nos pueden empujar uh, ayudar a empujar uh, el ejercicio de la democracia en nuestros países Yes, well, I think that the international community has a lot to do. And first of all, we have to demand to your governments and to your embassies 
that they are co coherent with uh, development projects, that all the international standards and protocols of defense of and protection of human rights are, defend, uh, are protected, and um, also to demand compliance with rulings. For instance, in the case of the repression in 2006, we had a ruling from the National Commission of Human Rights, and this was ignored, the same with the ruling from the Supreme Court. So there has been no compliance, and this is where you can help us to, uh, for democracy to be fulfilled in our countries. En el caso nuestro, en Oaxaca, ni siquiera se hacen estudios, pues no hay estudios de impacto ambiental, por ejemplo, que eso sería lo, lo más elemental para comenzar cualquier proyecto. Ni siquiera se hacen estudios, o sea, las empresas llegan y compran a, a alguna gente importante de gobierno, que es el que les asegura que el proyecto se va a hacer o a la buena o a la mala, ¿verdad? Y entonces eh, no hay, no solamente no hay consultas, sino no hay tampoco estudios, pues, y el, la consulta, pues, eh, la gente ni siquiera tiene información, menos consulta. Ahora mucha gente se ha estado dando cuenta de los proyectos, por ejemplo, en el caso, cuando ya está el trabajo, por ejemplo, en el caso de San José del Progreso, el caso que platiqué del padre Martín, o, o una presa que se quiere hacer una presa hidroeléctrica para generar energía alternativa que se quiere hacer en la costa y que bueno, la gente empieza a investigar porque no hay información. Yes, well, in, in Oaxaca, one of our main problems is that we don't have these studies of environmental impact that are essential. So the companies get there, they buy important people who have influence in the government and that will ensure that this project will go ahead, whatever happens. So there is no consultation, there are no studies, and people don't even receive information. So many times people realize when it is already a fait accompli, like in San Jose de Progreso and the story with Padre, of Padre Martin that I told you about earlier, or the same with a, a dam for uh, the creation of uh, electricity that was, go, was going to go ahead in, in the coast. Y finalmente para nosotros sí es muy difícil combatir la tensión que generan las empresas en las comunidades, la verdad, porque ellos desparraman dineros así como, como si hubiera abierto una llave de agua. Pues. Entonces es, para nosotros es muy difícil, por ejemplo, incluso hasta en la iglesia, ¿no? este, nosotros te vamos a construir tu capilla, ¿no? este, nosotros te vamos a hacer una escuela, pero la otra gente dice... Bueno, no queremos migajas, ¿no? Nos está pasando como hace más de 500 años, nos vienen a cambiar oro por cuentas de vidrio, ¿no? And uh, lastly, it's very, very difficult for us to fight against the division that is uh, in communities that is um, pushed by uh, big corporations. Because they come there, they get there with a lot, a lot of money, and sometimes they say, yes, even in the church it's difficult for us to deal with it, because they say we will build a chapel, we will build a school, but what everybody is saying is that we won't want, uh, don't want leftovers, because then we go back to the situation that we had 500 years ago, where they were exchanging um, gold for uh, pieces of glass. Thank you very much. We'll just come for very brief comments from the panelists. Actually, we did start 15 minutes late, so I think we're doing pretty well on time. Um, just to the question about what can the international community do to support human rights defenders? I mean, it's already been identified, but other human rights defenders that we hear from is it's actually extremely important that you meet with your elected members of parliament as individuals, but also in organizations. The truth is, is they want to get re-elected, and if they know that people are paying attention and that they too will have a political cost, then there's some gain to it. Another really important uh, thing that we've heard actually was on a panel um, <laughs> in Berlin that uh, Padre was on. We were talking about the, the role of the media and social media. Um, it's quite important that you find every avenue that you can to inform yourself about what's going on. Don't just trust the government and don't just trust corporate media. And in that place as well, 
Um, many of our defenders that we accompany have their own Facebook pages, their own websites, their own Twitter accounts. That's actually a really active and simple way for you to engage and actually help to make their voices louder as well. Muy brevemente, le diría básicamente el tema del fortalecimiento del papel de la comunidad internacional. Creo que los gobiernos del mundo y los estados deben ser congruentes y armonizar su legislación interna en términos de establecer mecanismos para fijar la responsabilidad civil, penal o administrativa de los directivos de estas empresas que delinquen en el mundo. No puede ser válido que sea criminal violar los derechos humanos en Londres, pero que no sea criminal ir a hacerlo en Colombia o en México. Quien delinque, el ciudadano británico, dueño de empresa o directivo de empresa que con sus prácticas viola los derechos humanos y participa en crímenes, dado el contexto de impunidad que existe en nuestros territorios, debería ser objeto de procesamiento en su lugar de origen. Y eso es deber de los estados adecuar esas normas en el sentido de facilitar y promover que esa responsabilidad criminal y esa responsabilidad civil sea fijada y sea establecida. Segundo, creemos que deben mirarse mecanismos para fortalecer la presencia de misiones que hagan seguimiento en terreno al papel de las empresas. Seguimientos que pueden hacerse desde instancias de la sociedad civil de cada uno de los países de origen de las empresas multinacionales. Y ahí los estados deberían facilitar y promover condiciones para que esas comisiones independientes puedan hacer esas, hacer esas labores de monitoreo y que informen a los estados, pero también a las sociedades. En relación con el tema de los, los estudios de impacto, efectivamente se hacen después de que se inicia la exploración momento en que ya empiezan a generarse daños y efectos con la sola exploración, pero además creo que los estudios no pueden ser solamente ambientales, los estudios deben compre compre comprender los impactos sociales y culturales que van a tener esos procesos de exploración o explotación. Es diferente el impacto que tiene en una comunidad campesina, una exploración a, a, a cielo abierto que la va a tener en una comunidad indígena o en una comunidad afrodescendiente. Hoy no existe ninguna obligación de hacer estudios sociales y culturales y debería necesariamente avanzarse en eso, pero adicionalmente los estudios en su integridad deben hacerse antes de que se inicien fases de exploración o fases de explotación. Y para concluir, va a ser, eh, vemos que ha sido positivo que el gobierno se hubiera planteado iniciar el proceso de devolución de las tierras a los campesinos Tristemente solo planteó que de los 6 millones 600 mil va a mirar procesos de restitución de 2 millones. De las 6 millones, el cálculo que se tiene hasta el momento estimado es que se ha avanzado en un 6.5% de las propiedades, pero el problema es que también la restitución debe ir acompañada con medidas de inversión social, con medidas de desarrollo, pues nada se saca, aunque una persona que ha sido obligada a dejar el campo regrese al campo sin condiciones para invertir, para ser rentable y productiva la tierra. Preocupa es que esto coincida con los lugares de exploración y explotación y el campesino se ve obligado a rentar su tierra y abandonar nuevamente el territorio. Muchas gracias. We need to ensure that the governments throughout the world be consistent and that they harmonize their national or internal legislation and they need to establish mechanisms in order to ensure that either civil or uh, criminal uh, acts do not remain um, unpunished and therefore that it is, can't be possible that a crime, a violation of human rights for example, uh, be outlawed in London and yet can be committed in Colombia. So a British citizen who is head of a business and who's violating human rights in Colombia should be tried in their own country of origin. And therefore, they need to promote mechanisms of accountability. Uh, secondly, they need to establish uh, mechanisms 
which uh, strengthen the presence of follow-up or observation missions in the areas where businesses are carrying out these projects. And this can include the participation of civil societies who are from the country of origin of the business itself. So this would help facilitate and uh, promote the uh, monitoring of the, the business's practices. And therefore, based on the information gathered, they then need to use this information to inform not only the states, but also society in general. As for the impact studies, it's true that these studies are often carried out after the exploration phase. These studies should not only take into consideration environmental matters, but also the social and cultural impact which it may have, uh, which the exploration phase may have. Um, also, we must take into account the different kind of impacts which it can have on different communities, for example, indigenous communities or communities of uh, African descent. So, social and cultural considerations need to be included in the studies and of course they need to take place before either the exploration or the exploitation phase. <laughs> it is true that the Colombian government is currently looking at res uh, restoring or giving back land to uh, people who have been displaced out of the 6.6 .6 million hectares uh, which have been taken. They're planning to uh, give back 2 million hectares. So far, only 6.5% of this two, to these 2 million hectares of land have been given back. However, this restitution needs to also be followed up by social investment and development because there's no point in enabling people to go back to their lands without giving them the resources to um, actually work the land and, and gain income from it. So the fear is that these people will go back and then they'll have to just rent it out to the businesses again and therefore lose what they just gave. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you for a great panel, everyone. I think it was Paolo Freire, I, I, I can't remember, who said, when I ask why people, well, when I give people, poor people bread, they call me a saint. When I ask why they're poor, they call me a communist. I think in, in this bringing together the human rights angle and the, the, re, the, 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 the causes behind it, which has to do mostly and almost, almost always with land and resources, certainly in my experience in Colombia when I was, when I was working with Christian Aid, it was a very similar situation. And this is in response also to the gentleman from the Foreign Office. The, the UK government, which is the one I know best, was absolutely firm in its commitment to human rights in Colombia. There's so much to support uh, human rights defenders, to visit them. That was the bit where you give, give bread to the poor. But when we started to talk about the relationship between multinationals and human rights, land and human rights, when we started to ask why are these people actually being attacked? What interests are they challenging? It was very, very hard to have that discussion with the British Embassy. The Canadians is another example. Some of the strongest advocates of human rights in any country you go to. When you start talking about mining, it's cut, cut off and it's very, very difficult and your relationship with the Embassy becomes that much more difficult to get invited to less parties, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so so um, I, I do think that is the main message that I would take away from, from this. Um, one, one of the main messages that I certainly took away from my, my time in Colombia. Um, I won't try and sum up what has been an absolutely um, fascinating and inspiring panel. Uh, I would like to thank very much the translators who I think have done an absolutely incredible job. It's a very, very tiring job, so well done. Thank you. I would like just personally to say how, how, how brilliant I think the work of PBI is. It's one of the most important organisations I've ever come across because of the work they do practically enabling people such as these two to get on with the absolutely crucial work they do uh, defending people's lives and interests. And finally, of course, thanks to the panel. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear from you and, and good luck with all of your work.